Everyone can have a seat now. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. Today, the service has been taken by the Environment Group, so I'm just helping out. Um, welcome to the service as we gather as the church in this location. And today, we're focusing on the relationship that we have as children of God with the rest of God's creation. So although the theme is plastics, we've got a real environment and how do we relate in our Christian faith to the rest of God's creation. And as with most things in the Uniting Church, we would expect a diversity of people's opinions. But we need to be reminded that Christ is the one who unites us together. So we can have diverse opinions and still be one in Christ, which is the whole basis of the Uniting Church. Let's now join together in our call to worship. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unscrutable, inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him? that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things, and to him be the glory forever. Amen. We join together in our first hymn, Thine be the glory. Thank you. Let us pray. 
Creator of the universe, we pray in gratitude and praise. You were there at the beginning of all things, shaping our world and preparing it for us. You have provided the mountains and the trees, the waters and the earth. Help us to be caretakers of your gifts, protecting the land from abuse and ready to share with all in need. Show us how to use our science and technology in creative, not destructive ways. Deepen our awareness of our connectedness with all your creation so that future generations will also enjoy your blessing. We confess that we have not always listened or seen the changes occurring around us. We've been lured away by our own interests and desires, influenced by the attitudes and practices of the world around us lulled into a false sense of security about the future health of our earth. Forgive us, Lord. Focus our eyes and open our ears to what we can do better. You entrusted your world to us as a gift. Help us to care for it and all people that we may live in right relationship with you, with ourselves, with one another, and so importantly, creation. You, loving God, see who we are and still stand by us, offering us hope, opportunity, and above all, forgiveness. Friends, receive God's forgiveness. May God's love set you free this day and always. Amen. I just realised I should have greeted the people who are joining us online as well. So welcome this morning to worship. And I should introduce a little bit more about myself. I'm currently on placement with St Luke's. I'm a candidate for ministry. And also I work point five as a pastor with the Armstrong Creek uh, faith community. Oh, we've got another hymn. There you go. I'll put plenty of hymns in today. So if you don't like the message, at least you've enjoyed the hymns. <laughs> so hymn number 106. Now thank we all our God.
<coughs> as we come now to our time of Bible readings and reflections, we're going to go through a process of having the first reading, then a reflection, and then the second reading and a reflection. So it's not deep and theological. <laughs> Some quick thoughts, because then we're going to have a longer message about plastics in our world. So thank you, Shige. Our first reading from, for today from the letter to Romans, chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do, we do not know what we ought pray for, to pray for, but the Spirit himself uh, intercedes for us through the through the word, wordless groan. And he who uh, search our hearts know that the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in according with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also pro, uh, predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and thus who uh, he uh, predestined his he also called those he called he also justified those he justified he also glorified what then shall we say in respond to these things if God is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son, but gave, gave, up, gave him up for, uh, up for us all, who will be not also uh, along with him uh, graciously, gave us all things. Who will bring any charge against the, the, those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who con condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it written, for, you, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, no, in all these things, we are more than con conquered th uh, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither an angels nor demons, neither uh, present nor future, nor any power, neither Heights, heights, nor depth, nor any, anything else, all creation, in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Shigeg, it wasn't an easy reading. But that's the, the big one done now. <laughs> now, 
Now, I've been a parent, as many of you have, for a few years now. And you know, with the younger children, you always try and encourage them. And so you, you overplay every achievement. So Fred, he, he can run the fastest. And Faith, she does the very most beautiful artwork. But when they get to be teenagers, I don't know about you, but for me, I kind of think that they need a reality check. So poor old Hope suffers. When Hope does all something and she comes in and says, oh, I've achieved this, I've achieved that, I said, yeah, that's not bad, but it's a bit rough. And all of these, you know, little teaching moments always come with a rant, the parental rant. So during one particular rant, I was outlining the idea of free will, you know, how you come down your teenagers say you can't do whatever you want. And we're reflecting on that because we don't, we don't really have much free will. And as I talked to Hope about it, I kind of became a bit downhearted of how much free will I don't have either. There's boundaries, what we can and can't do. Those boundaries are set by the law, by society, by government, by parents. Now God, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, does have free will because he has no limitations on himself. After my rant, this idea stuck with me, just how much our lives are controlled for us. Several weeks earlier at our faith community in Armstrong Creek, we'd looked at the subject of predestination, which again talks about the balance between God's will for us and our personal free will, our choice, we won't call it free will, our choice that we can make. So the question that comes to us from the Romans reading today, because it talks about predestination, is what does God do with his free will and what do we do with our choice? First, we learn that although humans have choice, they don't know what they should pray for. This comes through the text. So it is the spirit and God's searching of our hearts that enable us, us to pray. So it seems that our choice is to love God or to not love God. This is one of the major choices we make in life. To listen or not. And there's truly significant scope to this choice that God gives to us. The reading also frames the ongoing choices you will make in terms of God's own will, because he works for our good out of love. Because God has free will, he knew already who would choose to listen and to love him, to be shaped by Jesus, to be called, to be justified, glorified as Jesus was himself. And we can cast our minds back to the time Jesus was in the desert where he too made the choice to listen to God. This is all possible because of what God does with his free will, and that is that he chooses to love us. The reading says, are we like lambs going to the slaughter? And the answer is no, God loves us. He hasn't determined that we should be wiped out. Because he has free will, He's chosen to love us with that free will. And then he gives us the option to choose if we will love him in return. This understanding then sets us up for what the second part of the reading will say about the future. And it really breaks into a kind of hymn of love and praise that the writer is now overcome with his sense of God's great love for him. And so in this hymn of praise for God, who will not let us go, a love song, if you will. And the gist of this love song, the summary of it, is that with God's free will that he loved. And what greater thing is there in the whole of the universe than God's love that can undo it? 
And so he says nothing can separate us from God's love because it's not by our choice alone, but it's by God's choice to love us in the beginning. There's no charge that can be brought against us. Those who God has chosen to love, he's also chosen to justify through his son. There's nothing more powerful than God's will to love us. And finally, it finishes with a checklist of the things that cannot separate us from God's love. It could be that he was reflecting on the things that separate us from the love of family and friends and saying these things don't apply for God. Death nor life, angels nor demons, present or future or any kind of power, neither height nor depth or anything else in all of creation. And this is where I make my tenuous link with creation. The word creation also speaks of other stuff apart from humans. How does creation then fit into God's plan to pre-love? And it reminds us that not only are we known by God, but creation is also known by God. Yet it is subject to the human's choices. It has no choice of its own. Creation was made to love God, while humans were made to choose God. We see this idea at the beginning of Romans, in chapter 1, verse 20, where it says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, that is, creation, so they are without excuse. And so we get this vision of how then does creation fit into our human love, and we see that God has left himself with a testament in creation. Can you think of another place that we go to to know God? This is not rhetorical. Shout out some answers. Where do you go to if you want to know about God? Church, yep. Yeah. The Bible, that's the one I was looking for. And so creation becomes for us like the scriptures. We're told that the scriptures and the sacraments are given to the church to continue to feed the believers as we meet together. Creation is also another source of this way that God continues to feed the believer. As we walk out into the beautiful sunshine, we can see no limit to the sky. Where does it end? And this is a testimony to a God who is beyond ends and beyond beginnings. And so as we look at creation, it tells us about God. Now, what do you do with a Bible when it gets too old? Can you just throw it in the bin? What, my, I think I've got a collection of four or five on the bookshelf because I think I don't know what to do with them. You can't throw them away. You can give them away to people. I've heard of some people who say, you need to bury them like a person. So you give them a funeral, you bury them in the ground. But do we have the same respect for creation as the one who also speaks to us about God? We should have the same kind of reverence for creation as we have for the word that brings life to us. Now that leads into our second reading, which is a much shorter one. So thank you, Shigeg, if you'd like to come and share with us. Our second reading from the letter to Matthew, chapter 13, verse 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, mustard seed, uh, is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Th Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet then, that yet, when it grows, it is the largest of garden trees, and become a tree, so that the birds can come and 
perch in its branches. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. So in this section, we've heard a parable. In parables, usually, they're ever either contradictory, they're meant to wake you up to what's being said. And so there's a collection of parables here that are about choice, about doing something. A man plants a mustard seed. Having faith, it will grow. And a woman adds yeast to bread. Having faith, it will be enough to make the whole life rise. In both cases, it's something small that's done, but expecting some great blessing to come from it. These are both illustrations of the kingdom of God, or how God will is carried out. In both cases, something small is done with the belief that the effort will bring a reward. The man knows that the seed is small, but with time, it will become useful, a shady trub that even the birds can nest in. The woman with a little yeast is thinking of how much her family will enjoy the bread that she's baking, how it will fill their stomachs and give them nutrition in their diet. Both are like the kingdom of God. In both cases, it's something little that will not change the world, but will change the life of their family for their location. Why is the kingdom not like an earthquake? Why don't we have images that the kingdom of God is like lightning and thunder and things that everyone will take notice of? But we're told rather that it's about something small that then grows and brings a blessing to the people there. And the expectation is that if people all over are doing something small, then it will grow larger. It involves God's free will and human choice, one life at a time, over time. It starts small, but a cumulative effect can change the world in in like manner to an earthquake. Here at St Luke's, you have many groups, all motivated by the same love of God, motivated to serve God and also to serve the community in which they live. We've got the sewing group, the men's shed, repair cafe, messy church. Can you think of others? There's probably a few more I don't know about. (laughs) The environment group, but not forget them, as well as others. Each group is motivated by love that is expressed to God and also expressed towards the community. Each activity grows off God's preemptive act of love through Jesus Christ, which brings renewal to the world and community. There's a promise of something greater in everything that started. Now we might think that the sewing group is not going to change the whole world. It's not something big something small like the mustard seed. But for those people who come along, it makes a tremendous difference. It changes their world, which is connected to another world, halfway around another continent. And so we see how something small has a ripple effect over the whole world. And so we come to our next song, Touch the Earth Lightly. And it's a reminder that as we touch this earth, our touch is light and gentle. And it's the small things that we do that count, not changing the whole world in a big bang, but creating ripples of blessing that spread out. Thank you, Hope. You can stand up for this one.
going to bring us an interesting presentation about plastics in our oceans. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chris. Of course, this is misbehaving. So, there we go. Right. Plastic Free July. I want to talk to you about Plastic Free July. Who has heard of Plastic Free July? Not many. Plastic Free July is an initiative started in 2011 in Western Australia by one clearly inspiring leader and a small team from local government. The Plastic Free Foundation now has operations and affiliates across the globe and is recognised as one of the most influential environmental campaigns in the world. The aim of the Plastic Free Foundation is simply to reduce pollution caused by plastic. An Ipsos survey conducted in 2021 of over 20,000 people in 28 countries revealed that 29% of global consumers surveyed were aware 
of Plastic Free July as a campaign, and 13% had participated. An estimated at 140 million people from 190 countries took part in Plastic Free July in 2021. And I'd not heard of that until about a month ago. <laughs> when I've finished talking, hopefully I'll have inspired you to try harder to eliminate some of the single-use plastic from your life, or if you can't eliminate any, to at least send just one more of the plastics you discard regularly to a recycling operation. Eliminating or recycling just one more type of single-use plastic package each month, or each quarter, or each year will eventually make a difference. Small changes matter. But what has plastic, and in particular plastic waste, got to do with Christianity? God calls us to pursue an abundant life not an abundance of stuff. Christianity teaches us to be custodians of the treasures around us, to use and to enjoy them. Not to plunder those treasures with no concern for the consequences. And not to leave this place in a degraded condition for others and for future generations. Around the world, two billion people have no safe way to dispose of their rubbish. Many are forced to live and to work among piles of waste. Their waste doesn't get collected and taken away out of sight on a weekly roster. It contaminates their water sources. Burning it causes toxic fumes. It makes people sick and floods communities, causing up to a million deaths a year. That's one person dying every 30 seconds. The rapid growth of our use of single-use plastic packaging is like feeding this problem with growth hormones. It's fueling our throwaway culture, threatening people's health, and adding to the climate emergency. Rapid commercialisation of man-made plastic started in 1907 with the development of Bakelite. In the 115 years since, man-made plastics have become invaluable and indispensable in many modern applications. Every year, Australia now consumes three and a half million metric tonnes of plastic. But we discard over three million metric tonnes. 130 kilograms of plastic per person per annum. Phil, have you counted how many people we've got here today, this morning? Forty something, that's close enough. Forty nine, call it fifty. That's a total 130 kilograms of plastic per person per annum. That's a total of about six ton for the people here today that you discarded in the last 12 months. And we discard that every year and it's growing. What's in the future? Currently, Australia is about 130 kilograms of plastic per person per annum. In the USA, it's 250 kilograms per person per annum. 
Plastics are now in almost everything we use in our daily lives, in our vehicles, white goods, kitchenware, sporting goods, boats, electronics, footwear, appliances, office goods, construction, furniture, clothing, aircraft, health and hygiene products, gardening products. We even use plastic to buy our plastic. Our modern life would struggle in many areas if we suddenly stopped using all plastic. Modern health, care and hygiene metrics would get seriously ill and take a long time to recover if we suddenly had to stop using all plastics. But one million metric tonne of plastics Australians use and discard every year has been used just once. Most of it as packaging. For most everyday household consumers, consumables, you have to try and try really hard in many instances to find an equivalent product not packaged to some degree, in plastic. Research is only recently helping us realise some of the consequences of that 115 years of rapid growth of plastics in our life. As plastics age, many lose their plasticity, that magic quality which makes them so useful. When they lose that plasticity, they degrade they become brittle and fragile. Some become friable and the surface becomes chalky. So less attractive and less useful. So we discard them. With further ageing, plastics break down into microplastic fragments, very small particles of plastics or strings of plastic compound. The smallest, only microns in size. And I'm sorry, but microplastics is a term you'll just need to get used to hearing about. Microplastics are already, probably irreversibly, in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. They're in our agricultural soil, our waterways, our harvested crops, our marine ecosystems, our livestock, our fish, and inside us. And we're only just starting to research the possible consequences of that. Remember, Australians discard one million metric tonne of single-use plastic, most of it packaging, every year. We need that to change. Many Australian households now discard a lot of the single-use plastic packaging from their homes into their curbside recyc recycling bins, where it's collected, and we've done our job. What's the kids' nurseries rhyme say? What a good boy am I. Currently, just 36% of the plastic PET bottles sold in Australia each year are recycled. Nearly two out of every three PET bottles is not recycled. Because too many people just don't try that little bit harder, the waste collected from public spaces is usually contaminated by food or other non-recyclable garbage. If contaminated, it is rarely sorted for worker health and safety reasons. At present, if we don't take it home and put it in our household recycling bin, more than half of the material, which in principle is able to be recycled, ends up, at best, in landfill. Or far worse, roaming about unrestrained in the environment 
free range, if you will. I like that mental image. When I try and catch a plastic bag blowing around a beach or a park in the wind, I reckon I probably look like I'm trying to catch a free range chook. They're wily and conniving and they get away from you. <laughs> Most of those plastics which escape to roam free either end up as litter in our household and urban parks or on our agricultural lands. Or eventually, they find their way into Australia's freshwater and marine systems, either initially intact or after degradation as microplastics. Plastics in our agricultural areas affect crop growth by obstructing water and nutrient flow. And to livestock, it poses a significant ingestion, choking and entanglement hazard. In some low and middle income countries, studies have found up to a third of the cattle and a half of the goat population have consumed significant amounts of plastic because they mistook it for food. Worldwide, every year, it is estimated that 8 million metric tonnes of plastic end up in the marine environment. For Australia, every year, about 130,000 metric tonnes of plastic eventually leaks into Australia's coastal and marine environment. 130,000 metric tonne into our marine ecosystems alone. That 130 kilograms of plastic you discarded in 2019-20, eventually five kilograms of it will finish up in the Australian marine ecosystems simply because you threw it out and it escaped. 75% of the litter washing up on our shorelines is plastic. At present rate of growth of our use of plastic, which is driving the increase of plastic pollution, by the middle of this century, there'll be more plastic in the oceans than there are fish. Now, I'm data driven and I like to think that I understand what it's trying to tell me. More plastic in the oceans than there are fish. When I read that, I thought, that's ambiguous. More by number, more by weight, more by volume. So I tried to find out, and it only got worse. Some people said by 2050, some people said by 2060. I still don't know the answer. But does it matter? Fish stocks are declining, so many countries are trying to reverse that. But study of plastic waste in our ecosystems is relatively new, and every new bit of research just seems to find more plastic pollution in more places. Whatever it is, the real figure is dynamic and dramatic. Unless we, all of us, change our habits and quickly, by mid-century, the oceans will contain more plastic than fish. So if you've been watching the slides, to distract from the ugly things that I'm telling you, you've seen some pretty graphic photos of plastic waste and pollution from around the world. I'm sure you've heard before about the devastating health and social impacts of pollution in some areas. But plastic pollution is not just their problem. Over there. Not all use of plastic is bad, but pollution from plastic we fail to contain and to recycle effectively is a serious problem. Now, here in Australia. Australia is a rich country. 
We can develop solutions and lead by example. So we should do so now. Allowing the use, particularly of single-use plastic packaging, to continue to grow unrestrained is just blatantly arrogant. To believe it's okay because whatever is not recycled is contained in landfill is naive at best. It's far from true and it's not a solution. Yes, activism helps, but doing practical things in our lives, in our homes, in our church life will be far more rewarding on so many levels. So, for Plastic Free July, this August, because we're running a little late, I'd like you to examine your lives and your homes and your habits and think twice every time you put something plastic into your garbage. Commit to eliminating or sending for recycling just one more type of plastic single-use plastic packaging. Then form a new habit. Every quarter hereafter, consider again if there's another garbage plastic you can eliminate. So here are a few ideas to get you started. Do you use packaging when buying fruit and vegetables? Do you reuse that packaging? Why not? The recycling trolley in the church foyer has bins to help you recycle a few plastic products. Do your plastic bottle lids go in your garbage or can we take them to lids for kids? Can we take your dental care products to TerraCycle? Emptied and clean, please. Or your plastic pens. Or your electronic e-waste. Or your spectacles. Our collectibles and antiques people accept and rehome many things. And the men shed dismantles some failed appliances to get scrap value for some of their materials before throwing out your unwanted or failed goods, speak to Ray or Linda or Ken or Jeff and offer it there. Many large plastics are not suitable for your recycling bin. They're too big. The recycling processes don't want them. Plastic furniture, laundry baskets, buckets, If provided you, you disassemble them to remove everything that is not plastic, in particular remove all, all metal, screws, handles, whatever, they can be taken out to the recycling centre, resource recovery centre out at Duro Street. Ladies, if that's too much for you, I'm sure Ken or Jeff if you approach them with a pleading smile and a nice fresh cake in hand, the men's shed will bend the rules and see what they can do to help you. Graft and corruption should not be excluded to the political class. <laughs> to their misfortune and annoyance and regret but through no fault, some people are the source of a veritable confetti storm of medicine blister packs. Good news. There are now three pharmacies in the Height and Belmont area and more elsewhere around Geelong who from the beginning of July this year commenced a 12-month trial to collect medicine blister packs and send them to an organisation called Pharmacycle for recycling. Pharmacycle is charging those pharmacies for that service. So understandably, 
pharmacies would probably like your business as well as your returned blister packs. Since they're not accepting large volumes, and particularly not from people who are not customers, we can't add a bin to our recycling trolley just yet. But if you have blister packs, I encourage you, again, put on your most pleading expression and go visit those pharmacies. The nearest pharmacies are the Discount Chemist up at Barrable Hills, Parties Eastbrook opposite the Belmont Post Office on Carrio Street near the intersection of High Street, Roslyn Road and Carrio Street behind the 7-Eleven, and the Cardinia Pharmacy where the South Barwon Council offices used to be, where Cardinia Health now are, South Barwon offices used to be. So those are the three closest uh, members of the Pharmacycle, but there are many others around Geelong if you look up Pharmacycle on the, on the web. You were given a scroll as you entered church today. It suggests 20 simple steps you can take. Please take it home and read it. For more ideas, look for the websites of the Plastic Free Foundation and Tear Fund. They have lots of ideas. And finally, thank you for giving me a little of your time and for listening. Thank you, Chris. Okay, now we're singing our last hymn, number 477, Jesus Calls Us Here to Meet Him. Now come to our time for notices and we don't have them up on the screen so if there's anyone who knows of something happening in the next week or things we need to know about um, you can pop your hand up and you're invited to come up and tell us about it. Any notices? Sewing group next on this Friday. Yes, I keep forgetting Sundays are the first day of the week. Okay, any other notices? Okay, then we're going to take up our offering to the work of God.
Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your constant provision for us. You give us food on our plates. You give us sunshine to bring our hearts full of joy. And as our years come close, we see that you continue to walk closer with us as well. We pray that you accept these offerings from our pocket, the food, and we pray that we are able to give to the work of you in this church and in the society in which we live. We pray that you, through us, would feed the hungry, open the eyes of the blind and continue to heal those who are brokenhearted. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you. Let me just pop it up there. Okay, Sue's going to bring us the prayer of intercession. Thanks, Sue. And for anyone who feels like they'd like to light a candle for someone they've got a special needs, you can welcome to come up and light a candle for them during the prayers of intercession. Thanks, Sue. At the uh, conclusion of these prayers, we'll be having the Aboriginal Lord's Prayer that we've had before. Let us pray. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as sisters and brothers, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes, bringing healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognise that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey to you, towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love and peace. Christ our Lord, both divine and human, you lived among us and died for our sins. Help us to imitate your love for the human family by recognising that we are all connected to our brothers and sisters around the world, to those in poverty impacted by environmental devastation and to future generations. Holy Spirit, giver of wisdom and love, you breathe life in us and guide us. Help us to live according to your vision, stirring to action the hearts of all, individuals and families, communities of faith and civil and political leaders. Triune God, help us to hear the cry of those in poverty and the cry of the earth so that we may together care for our common home. Creator God, may all that encourages the people of the world in goodness, honesty and compassion be blessed and grow. May all that encourages self-seeking and cruelty, prejudice and deceit wither and be exposed as the unsatisfying rubbish it is. May we learn from one another's cultures and respect one another's differences. Compassionate God, we thank you for the joy of human love and for all those among whom we live and work. We pray particularly for loved ones who worry us with their health or circumstances or life direction. We pray for those among our friends and families who do not know you or whose faith has been shaken. Loving God, we pray for all whose backgrounds make belief in a loving God laughable or terrifying. 
We pray for all who suffer mental or emotional anguish and those who despair. We pray for those facing another day of pain, another day of hunger, another day of fear. On this day, we pray for all places in our world where people are unsure whether they will see the morning light again. Many countries in Africa and Europe where war continues and what we take for granted, food, shelter and safety, is not possible. We pray for the Vietnam War Vigil to be held this week, where services of remembrance will take place at every grave or commemorative plaque site across the nation and overseas. We think with compassion of all those who died and the families they left behind. We also think of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice in all theatres of war. Create, O oh God, your creation is warming. We pray for those affected in the Northern Hemisphere where wildfires have ravaged many countries, destroying homes, wildlife and disrupting the lives of many. We can continue to pray for our areas in our own country affected by flooding, in particular Rochester and Mullumbimby and all the other small places and larger in our country. This Sunday morning, our thoughts are also with the families of the missing helicopter crew in Queensland, as well as other families who are experiencing unexpected death. Wrap your arms around them. Gracious God, we remember with gratitude all who gave so much to bring the good news to our country and pray that with us it may continue to be spread until the whole earth knows of your truth and love. Merciful God, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
invite you all to stand for the blessing and then we'll finish with our final hymn. May God bless us with the wonder of creation's glory. May God bless us with his fury at creation spoiling. May God bless us with courage at this critical hour. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon us and in all creation this day and for the future to come. Amen. Amen. And our last hymn, number 569, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer.